Welcome to She Sells Radio. All right, my friend, if you were listening to this show, I know that you want to sell more. Need I say more? You're here. This is what you're here for. And whether you are an entrepreneur or a sales professional, you care about growing your client base and the brand and reputation that you're building in your space as well. So today I am going to introduce you to someone who I feel now is like a brother, a great friend of mine, and someone who I also have the most respect for, for his thought leadership in the space of marketing, sales, and branding. So my guest today, Mark Drager, I'm going to tell you more about him in just a minute, but he was introduced to me a while back by our mutual friend, Bo Hawkins. So shout out to Bo, if you're listening. And I was honored to recently go on his podcast, how to sell more, which we'll tell you a little bit more about today too, because it's a phenomenal show and like best title for a podcast on the planet too, by the way. Yeah. So in getting to know Mark and talk with him more, he shared with me this concept that he calls core brand identity, and it is so brilliant. You're going to want to learn it and what it is to, so that you can apply it to help you amplify your brand and your sales. Again, whether you're in corporate or an entrepreneur. So let me tell you just a little bit more about Mark before I bring him on. And then we're going to get into the interview. Mark Drager is the founder and CEO of Sales Loop, which if you're in the sales space, you have probably heard of. He's won 32 in industry awards and produced $14 million in content. He is also a father of four. So massive respect on that front. <laughs> and he's had offbeat adventures, which I think would be fun to weave in today. Cause I want to find out more about these, including having a Boeing 737 for the day twice a heated encounter with a billionaire, which is very fascinating to me, and even shedding 70 pounds in his late 30s, which is quite a feat and an accomplishment. Mark, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you for joining me. I can tell, Elise, why people love your vibe so much, because um, you make everybody feel so good. That was the greatest intro ever. <laughs> Oh, I'm so good. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, I was like, man, we could talk about, obviously we're going to talk marketing and branding and all the things that you're known for, but also just your life experience is so interesting to me. Oh, well, I thank <laughs> you. Uh, most people, most people call it a bit crazy. So I appreciate that. That's great. Even better. I would always rather be called crazy than normal. You know what yeah. I mean? I think you yeah, probably- the right type of crazy. That's usually what I'm trying to figure out. Is this the right type? And, <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we, we make some mistakes, but that's okay. That's okay. That's such as life. Speaking of, because you're so obviously entrepreneurial journey mistakes, we learn, we do all the things. I want to hear a little bit more about your background though, getting into this. So you started off as an entrepreneur in 2006. Is that right? with yeah. no experience and you built and launched this incredible sales organization, marketing, branding organization, um, that I was talking about a little bit earlier in the intro. What was that like? For, I, I feel like our journeys were maybe similar and mine was like, I want to get out of corporate. I'm going to go work for myself and I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's gotta be better than this. <laughs> I don't know if yours was similar <laughs> to that or what prompted you to start your entrepreneurial journey, but why don't we start there and what that was like for you long with, you know, no experience and figuring it out as you went. Yeah. Well, I was raised in a family of builders. And so like, like, like residential uh, development, home builders, custom home builders, apartments, high rises, things like that. Because my grandfather, who's my hero, and he's still alive today, he's turning 95 uh, mm. in, in a few weeks. Uh, he, he was like post-World War II, came, came to Canada from Germany and, and, and became a builder and hustled. And so I was raised in this family where like there was a family business, like my grandfather's business and my uncles were in it. And my mom is, is super the type of person to just jump into anything. Mm. And so I was lucky enough to be surrounded by people who had not taken the corporate path. And so uh, I went to film school. And when I graduated, I worked in television and I worked in um, live events and I worked in sales, uh, selling, selling AV for these live events. And I found my way into uh, a franchise organization. I worked in the head office. We had 1,500 offices, 90 countries and territories, and I was responsible for producing all of the video communications. Mm. So this is for training, franchise development, marketing, um, and, and client marketing, uh, partner relationships. Uh, and so I was there for a year and a half, 
And what was so interesting about it was my my internal clients, and, and you got to understand, I'm like 22 here. Yeah. <laughs> my mm. internal clients uh, were all of the C-suite uh, executives and the founders. I didn't mm. sit with, even though I was like five levels down, uh, three, 400 person um, entrepreneurial led organization. Uh, because of the nature of my work, I spent all day, every day working with, yeah, the, the C-suite, the board and what have you. And I became mm. friends with them. And and so I picked up and I learned so much because not only was it a franchise system, not only did I learn business, not only was I surrounded by C-suite people and and entrepreneurs, but it was an internet marketing mm. business. It was an internet marketing franchise. So in 2005, 2006, I'm learning about split testing. I'm learning about, um, I'm learning about how to analyze whether a business needed to generate leads and what type of leads and how do you build um, models to to be able to uh, discern you know the quality of leads and lead scoring and and just all of this stuff. And naturally, as one does when they're kind of young, my 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 wife and I we got married young. We had my first daughter young. She the, the week she was born, I finally was like, you know what, you know what I should do? I should quit my job. <laughs> And because, because when you're, you know, like, what was I? 23. I was 23 at the time. When you're 23, you're like, I've been doing this a year and a half. I know everything. Like what, like what else can these people teach me? Cause I was so <laughs> hungry to learn. And because I'd been thinking about starting my own business for, for frankly, a few years already, cause I was surrounded by these builders. I was like, my pitch to my wife was, honey, I know you're not working. I know we're both 23 and we have like no money and we're living in this apartment. And, and my daughter is like a week old. But if I make like 45 grand a year, now we lived in Toronto, which is basically like the Manhattan of Canada. Very, very expensive. And our household income was 45 grand a year. But my pitch was, if I make 45 grand a year working for one company, imagine how much money we'll make if I work for 10 companies. Mm. And she was like, I don't know. And anyway, that was not the soundest <laughs> logic, but we burned the boats. I quit my job. Uh, and three or four years of struggling later, I figured things out. We were able to, mm -hmm. by year five or six, we hit, I think, our first million dollar year in business. Wow. And uh, by the time COVID hit, we were doing uh, a, a, around two million in revenue with a 24 person team. And from when we started producing really bad work to where we ended uh, is like 2,000 projects later, 300 customers, 29 industries. And as you mentioned, quite a bit of revenue uh, in terms yeah. of, in terms of client work. Wow. Oh my gosh. So many things we could take from that, including one of the most important sales pitches you ever made in your life, right. To your wife. Hey, if I, and I, I like the logic. I can appreciate the logic if I'm yeah. making <laughs> too bad. That's not how business really works, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, at a very surface level, I see what you were getting at. <laughs> what would you say? So we're going to get into your methodology shortly here, because this is really why, you know, why I want to have you here, but that you shared there, those four to five years of struggle when you launched and, and then getting to the place where you hit your first seven figure year and then scaling to 2 million. I know you can't distill it down to just one or two things, but just as you reflect back on what were one of the top, like one to two things that shifted in you mindset wise. We talk a lot on the show about the power of mind over matter, like literally why our mind is so important as founders, as CEOs, as sales leaders, what shifted in you mindset wise that you think helped get out of that period of struggle to really see the successes? Was it just mm -hmm. persistence and you just got, I'm assuming you had to grow and evolve a lot yourself. I, I did, but, but I don't, I'm not certain if I focused on mindset either because at the time, again, going back to 2006, 2008, 2010, um, there wasn't a huge focus on mindset. When I started, I was not an entrepreneur. I was a business owner. That's the term we used. I was a small business owner. Um, and so I really started to focus on mindset when things got much larger and scarier. Mm. Really in those first few years, I focused on, on, on skill set and tactics. Yeah, and so most of the breakthroughs was um, was really doing a like getting really really deep and strategic to understand the different types of clients, um, mm -hmm. the different departments within clients, the different uh, the different um, seniority levels, the the reasons for purchasing, um, how we would tailor our pitch or approach for let's say if we're doing a communications with an HR department, they would buy for a very different reasons than Marcom or than sales or than what have you, and. Because what we were selling is higher ticket and lower volume, 
it mm-hmm. just took a lot of time to, to, to develop the pattern recognition. Yeah. It took me a long time before I could go, oh, client, you know, client, you want internal communications for employee engagement. So what do you actually need and want? And what has happened in the last few years that has led to this, this idea that maybe employees aren't a- attached to the brand or attached to the culture or connected? Oh, you've grown through acquisition? Oh, you've grown through acquisition pretty dramatically? And people who were in the companies that have been acquired actually had an affinity more to the previous ownership than current ownership? Mm. And then I see this four or five times and I go, ah. And then the next time I sit down with someone who is talking about employee engagement, I will ask them what's led to this point. If they've mentioned acquisition at all, I already know what the challenge and problem is. Mm, mm. That took me time to figure out and to mm. analyze and then to be able to develop the pitch and and the and the messaging for each segment, each audience, each uh, purchasing decision. Mm-hmm. And once I figured that out, then sales became easy. <laughs> Got it. Interesting. That makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. What would you say then you said as things got larger, you had to focus more on adapting your mindset. What, what was the shift you had to make, or maybe you're still making it now. I don't know, but, um, just to continue to grow and lead at a higher and higher level. Yeah. So, so one is that in the past, I've not been a very good people manager being a, Mm. you know, being an entrepreneur, being someone who is a builder, being someone who can figure things out on the fly. Um, I don't really see the need for, uh, you know, checks and balances or bureaucracy or slowing yeah. things down. But now I know how important that is. Um, equally, I used to be quite anxious and stressed out. And I used that um, that kind of what I would, might call a pressure cooker environment to be able to to drive really dramatic results. But it came mm-hmm. at a cost for hu- human capital. Um, and... Uh, you know, not not just myself, but the culture and the team members I put in place. We've had, you know, I'm not proud of this, and and it was wake up calls every step along the way. But you know, in the past, being very marketing and being very um, uh, uh, production based, it tends to like I come from a film and television background, and then communications and advertising marketing, it tends to be very male dominated. So mm. we really struggled to be able to onboard. Uh, women within our within our not because I thought of our culture, but perhaps because of our culture, and we would look at it and go, well, why are all of our clients women, but all of our team men? And mm. how does that relationship work? And we had clients start to comment on it. We'd walk into a boardroom, uh, you know, we we had a client, <laughs> we had a client who was responsible for managing. It, it was a management firm responsible for managing four hundred and fifty billion dollars of assets, and we were the agency of record. But when we walked in. It was, it was female leader, female leader, female leader, and my my relationship client. And we walked in as five guys, you know, head of strategy, head of this, head of creative mm-hmm. direction. And and one of the women said, like, there's a lot of guys here. Yeah. And so that that took us so much effort and so much time to focus on and change. And that's just one. That's just one example. But, yeah. um, you know, those those were the things that required me to move away from being. Uh, more, fo- <laughs> frankly, more f- just focused on revenue and sales, revenue and sales, revenue sales, mm-hmm. to to actually building the team, the 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 structure, the culture, uh, the the thing that will be sustainable and that I would be proud of 10, 20, 30 years from now. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. That's like that's very aligned with where I am right now in my own journey and just thinking it's so different as you start to grow and scale. And it's not just you getting to call all the shots and do all the things. And, um, and I, so again, I, I resonate and I appreciate that. Tell us, so, so let's dive into this. So this concept of core brand identity, again, you and I, I think it was just a, a coffee chat or we were just like even off the record talking and you were like, yes, yeah, so I've like developed this concept and I'm teaching it on different stages. And, and I, and you started sharing it. I was like, this is brilliant. <laughs> like this. <laughs> Why did I not? It's kind of like when you do the, the Enneagram and you're like, oh, that makes so oh, much. Oh, sense. Enneagram. What are, what, have we talked about this? What are you doing Enneagram? What? So I'm a three. What are you? Oh, achiever. I'm a know. six. I'm the least, I'm the least likely to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> really? Oh. Oh, because we're afraid of everything, right? Like, <laughs> like, like I'm afraid of like our, you know, the Enneagram, right? It's based on fear. So, so like, <laughs> know that. Uh, number six is fear is fear. It's the only one listed there. Like, 
<laughs> eights are lack of control, you know, uh, ones are that they won't be good enough, twos are that they won't be needed or loved. Like we can go through all of this. I'm deep what in this. What is three? But... Hold on. What is... I didn't even know I was opening up a whole can of worms. What is three? I don't, I don't know any of this. Do you know? <laughs> so as the achiever, as the achiever, what, what achievers tend to do now we're in the same triad. So, okay. so, um, so you will move to six or nine in times of peace or strength. And I okay. move to three in times of, so when I said pressure cooker environment, yeah. That, when I am stressed out, I move to a three and take on a threes uh, oh, uh, identity. And so, so threes as the achiever are very good. And this one might, you know, uh, Rachel Hollis is a three I've heard as well. Okay. And, um, leaders tend to be this. So you'll walk into a room and you'll quickly be able to take a temperature check of the room and right. you will immediately um, come to understand exactly how you need to show up and who you need to be in that situation to serve others. Now, mm -hmm. when you're constantly doing that and constantly shifting who you are to serve others and to achieve and to get the gold star and to be recognized and all of those things, what you're left with is asking, well, what is the real version of me? What is the true version Ooh, of me? Yeah. And if I'm this for everyone else, I'm, I'm never quite sure what the real me is. Wow. And so the, the number one fear is that, that, is, um, is that um, you just, if, if you're not providing value, you can't be loved. Oh, okay. Yeah. That resonates a hundred percent. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And you're also, you're also in the past because there's di different times. So yeah. you, you tend to operate in the past, uh, twos, okay. threes, and fours operate in the past and you're in the shame triad as well. So when you're beating yourself up, you're going to, you're going to hit on key points of shame. Um, okay. you're going to get stuck in the past, which can lead to depression and, um, kind of melancholy, but at the same time, you just feel this constant drive to be able to deliver. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. We'll do a part two <laughs> about the Enneagram because I didn't realize you were. So, I've not, I don't think I've ever talked about the Enneagram on the show. I did, I was like, I don't know why I'm like feeling called to bring this up, but that makes total sense. So I just got a mini therapy session or a deeper <laughs> understanding. So thank you for that. When you were sharing this concept of the core brand identity, it was, it was similar in that it was like, oh, that's why I like doing certain things when it comes to my brand. That's why I also don't, or I'm not as good at others. And it just, it helped clarify, at least for me as a, as a sales leader and entrepreneur, like how I can best show up in my business and how I can best position the brand. So can you share with everyone, what is this concept? What does it mean? And how do we start to apply it in order to amplify our brand and amplify our results in what we're doing? I would I would love to. So the first thing I want to start with is is if you're listening to this right now, I, I mean you might be driving or working out or something. So I don't want you to actually raise your hand, but I want you to mentally raise your hand if if this resonates with you. Isn't sales and marketing overwhelming? Like Every time that I think about all of the things I need to do in my business or the team or the vendors, or I think I go to conferences and they're like, yeah, Yo, you got to be on TikTok dancing and you got to do this and you got to, <laughs> everyone's got a strategy. Everyone has a recommendation and is so completely overwhelming because frankly, there's not enough time or money or energy to do all the things you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so typically when business owners, we, we, we work, we specialize with B2B business owners, but typically when they're coming to us, it's because they're doing a lot of time and money and effort. They're, they're putting a lot of things into stuff and it's not getting results. They don't really know why. They don't really know how to fix it. They don't really know what they're supposed to do next. They just know they're supposed to do this stuff because we hear it on social. We go to events. We talk to everyone and it's like, this is what I need to be doing. And I, I think of everything, like like think of all the different platforms. Think of blogging, think of photos, think of doing YouTube lives versus IG lives versus, you know, should we be on LinkedIn and should we be here? And and that's just social media. That's not should we podcast and what type of podcast and should we blog and should we do SEO and should we do Google ads and should they be local ads or should they be this ads? Or sh and when we're doing a Facebook campaign, should the Facebook campaign be just directed to a landing page? Should we have a click funnel? Like, all of the stuff is overwhelming. And so all I'm interested in is finding the lowest risk, highest impact, quickest way to sell or, hmm. or frankly, to achieve your goal, right? Mm -hmm. To achieve your goal. Because some people, they, they, don't, they don't really think of it as selling. Like if we're doing a recruitment campaign and you're building a team, 
there most of the time people don't think of it as selling. I think of it as selling. We're selling the opportunity. We want the best candidates. We want the most number of candidates. We have the best choice. And we would ideally like to get them at lower than market rates, right? Like that's that's what we want. But most people don't think of recruitment as selling or they don't think of building a following and an audience as selling or they don't think of showing up you know through this podcast. We met through our mutual friend Bo through podcasting, this is leveling up my network. I'm I'm getting the opportunity to learn so much from you and what you do, and and hopefully I add some value to you as well. But but that's that's like it, the way I think of it is like we need to show up a certain way to be able to earn the right for this this networking opportunity. Mm. So mm. I'm interested in one. What is our goal? Like let's be objective about this. Let's be specific about this. Let's be really clear about it. And what is the lowest risk, highest impact, quickest way for us to get there? Now, that would be not for us to become brand new people, not to learn brand new things, not to learn things that are way outside of our comfort zone. The lo lowest risk, highest impact, quickest way to do something is to do something that comes naturally to you. Mm. And that will only take you so far, right? And we all, we all think as business owners like, oh, man, I got to do stuff that is infinitely scalable. And no, 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 no. When you're starting anything, when you're trying to figure something out, you're not even in the optimizing mode. You're not in the growth mode. You're not in the scaling mode. You're in the like, what, like anything we do, um, think of the biggest loser, right? The biggest loser, all they have to do is diet and exercise and drink water and they will shed pounds mm -hmm. because, because they don't have to get to the complicated stuff yet, right? Like, frankly, they just have to make a few life changes and they will see dramatic results. And so when it comes to our sales, our brand, our marketing, our lead generation, our advertising, when it comes to all the things that we do to make sure people know us and like us and trust us, want to speak with us, and then we want to convert them, and then we want to get referrals, like think of the entire process. Why is it that we focus on all the really fancy stuff and complicated stuff, ignoring the simplest things that come naturally to us? Hmm. And this is what the core brand identity is, because having worked with hundred, hundreds of companies, in 29 industries and produced thousands of projects. Over the last 10 years, I've noticed, um, specifically in the last 10 years, I've, I've noticed that what would work for one client wouldn't work for another. And I, I couldn't figure out why. And when a client would come to me and I would su suggest a strategy or tactic that I had a lot of confidence in, why would they say no if it's going to mm -hmm. get their results that they want? And I could not figure this out. Until I had, I, had, I had noticed a pattern amongst the business owners and, and the, the clients that we're working with. And that's what the core brand identity is based on. So if, if I can, I'd love to share just three quick stories, which I think will help yes. enlighten this. Yeah. So I mentioned, you know, it's been about 10 years. We have a client who, uh, who runs, <laughs> he started as a welder. Hmm. He started as a welder and he, and he talked his way into welding because he didn't even have any experience. He needed a job. He got a job. They said, he said, I could weld. He spent three days figuring it out and he became a welder. That welder, as a welder, he then started to become a salesperson and account manager, but he'd started on the floor. Then he started his own business as a metal shop. And over the course of something like seven or eight years, they grew it into a $70 million privately held company. Mm. Um, very, very successful. And what they do is they help retailers build stores. So they do the retail environment design. They do all the shelving. They do all the fixtures, all the lighting. They like a, a store. Walgreens will get an empty box. Someone has to decide what goes in that box. Mm. My client is the one who who designs and builds and installs and merchandises these stores. And we've been working together for a, about 10, 12 years now. But in 2018, we took them through a rebrand because we moved them from being manufacturers. They were very manufacturing heavy. And we realized we were missing out on a lot of the decision-making because decisions were being made at the design side earlier mm -hmm. in the process. And they didn't want to just bid on RFPs to make stuff. They wanted, they wanted to be involved earlier in the process. So we took them through a rebrand and we did a ton of stuff for them. Long, long story short, after a few years of us doing stuff, he would always push back. The business owner would always push back and go like, why are we giving money to, to, to Google for ads? I don't like that. And why are we doing this money? And why are we doing that money? And we'd come up with these suggestions to make them a market leader and be perceived as a market leader. And he would say, no, he wasn't comfortable with it. He didn't want to do it. Mm. But the ads kept bothering him. But meanwhile, they, they, they sponsor like a private event 
at Formula One in Montreal and fly people in or the local lacrosse team or this or that. And I go, you're spe- <laughs> why would you spend all this money on these sponsorships? But you're upset about the like $3,000 a month we're spending just to generate some attention and, and, and leads. And so like it was ROI positive. I could not figure it out. Hmm. So that's story number one. Story number two, we had a client who we were working with who got upset with us when we generated more leads with for this person if the leads weren't high quality. Mm. Now, when you're doing advertising, you're going to like you're looking for diamonds in the rough, right? Like we all know from a sales point of view and it's a numbers game and you want to qualify or disqualify the people quickly, but the more lead gen you do, the, the just the higher volume of of dud calls you're going to get. Now, you can work some steps into your lead generation process to try and scrub people out, but if you go too tight with that, then frankly, you might be turning away people who are making purchasing decisions before you've led them to the purchasing decision, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Mm-hmm. And so what we want to do is, you know, we're going to have false positives. We want the most number of people to jump on the call so that, so that way salespeople can manage the calls, manage the leads, and direct people in the right way. But this person was like, I don't want to talk to any of those people. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, you want... You want us to only put you on the call with people who are like 100% ready to buy? Like, that's not how it <laughs> works, is it? And I was like, that's so strange. Just like the first person. Why, why, why are you upset about this little bit of money that's going to Google when it's RI positive? Second client, why is it? Why are you so upset that you have to talk to people? That's so strange. And then a third story. My really good friend, Evan Carmichael. Some people might know him. He's a YouTuber. He has like 7 million subscribers. And, um, and I've known him for a long time, since 2007. I shot his first YouTube video, personally, myself. And uh, so I've known him for a long time. And we've always jumped on these projects together because I like to help his business. He helps mine. And we just, we just, we're friends. We help each other. But because we're friends, I can push him in ways that others can't. And over the last few years, he has really leveled up his network. You know, he's, he, he has personal relationships with people like Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins and Lewis Howes and... Uh, the, you know, Tom and Lisa bill you and um, Jenna Kutchner. And I could just like go on and on and on because, because yeah. they're part of this secret slash not so secret mastermind group that <laughs> Russell Brunson's in and everybody seems to yeah. be a part of. And, uh, and so he'd come back from these events and he'd be like, Oh, you know, like they, these people are doing these techniques or this, or they're doing, they're doing a book like free plus shipping and how do we make it work? And yeah. long story short, again, we would do all these things and and every time we we would go to do a strategy, if it didn't work, I would get this resistance or pushback. And I think that's strange. Mm. And when I share my keynote, and we go through the workshop, I explain these stories in greater detail. But just for the illustrate the point, the point is, it's like, isn't that strange? Isn't it strange yeah. that what would work for one business owner, someone else just, it, it just rubs them the wrong way. And that's when I realized um, that there are three different types of businesses three mm. different types of business owners, three different ways that people generate leads or business or, or revenue and sell. And so I want to share that with you real quick. That's, the, that's what we've called your core brand identity. You have something, you have traits that are innate to you. And if I were to come into your business and give you a rebrand, I'm going to give you a better tagline. I'm going to give you better look, better feel, better colors. I'm going to give you all of the psychographics of your breakdown, your paths to your clients or prospects, what your competition's doing. Like, when we come in, we do these really deep brand strategies. So what we give you will make sure that you show up saying the right things, looking the right way, making people feel what they need to feel to move forward. Mm. Really tactical, really strategic. But when I started doing this, I was, I was doing like a home makeover for people, right? And, and I would do this makeover for people and they'd be so excited and they love it. And then six or nine months later, I'd be like, why aren't you leveraging this? Why aren't you using it? Why, like, why have you moved away from these very simple things I've given you that you can do? And what I realized was I was, I was making them over, but, but every step along the way, they had to make decisions in their business. They had to make investments in their business. They had to manage people, manage teams, manage vendors, and they were doing what came innately to them, not mm-hmm. to this fake wrapper that I put on them. And so... What really is important is for all of us as sales professionals, as business owners, is to understand that we got to start. And this is where I started the whole rant is we have to start with what comes truly to us before we start to work on becoming a different version of us. 
And your mm -hmm. core brand identity is going to be one of three things. So my first client, the one who with the retail designer who pushed back on Google, he is a hunter. His whole organization is set up as a hunter. And that hunting mentality means that you got to go out there and you got to find it and you got to kill it and you got to bring it in and you got to do that every day. That's, that's basically a sales organization. If you're the type of organization where you track sales calls or have a sales floor, uh, when like, like anyone who knows Gong as software, the only people I know who know Gong are, are sales organizations and they're tracking their management. The, the, and, and the way that this shapes your brand your marketing, your advertising is that, frankly, you would rather get people on a call and lead them through a sales process. The franchise I started at for franchise development marketing, we were generating 18,000 leads a month for a team of wow. 200 people, a of, 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 of phone team of 200 people who are just hitting the phone all day long every day. Mm -hmm. That is a sales organization. Mm -hmm. And so when I developed brand or strategies or, or advertising or marketing or anything, frankly, at the end of the day, sales organizations really need to focus on lead generation and sales enablement tools. Anything outside of lead generation and sales enablement tools is a nice to have. And, and you, you will see huge revenue generating organizations that have zero brand because all they care about is, can I generate the lead? Can I work the lead? Can I close the lead? Mm -hmm. And so... That is what my client wanted to do. And so it made sense for him to sponsor these events because he was very relation-based and he would invite people out and he would close business at the Formula One. It made sense for him to sell it that way. But me generating, doing this or doing all these other strategies or whatever, he's like, why would I do that? Waste of time and energy. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll just call Tim up and I'll say, Tim, what are you doing next quarter? Like he... <laughs> And, and so it's foreign if you're not a salesperson or in a sales organization. Now, every organization has to do marketing and brand and sales. So it's not like you can opt out of it. It's just how do you go about it? Where do you invest? And where should your brand take you? So that's the first. Second, the, 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 the client who did not want to talk to anyone who was not pre-qualified. That's a farmer. And farmers will spend all season you know, preparing the fields and planting everything and working everything and watering everything and spraying everything and making sure that it's all good and fertilizing and taking care of everything. But at the end of the season, after all of that work, they have a harvest and everything lands in a, in a matter of a few days. And it's made the entire year's work worth it. The farmer is a marketing organization. These are people who will suggest to you, why aren't you running, like, why aren't you running, um, campaigns on IG and Facebook. And I would start with, with like 32 different ad sets. And then I would break it down with multiple call to actions. I would see which one pulls the best. And then anyone who's gotten up to 50% watch time on these videos, I would start a retargeting campaign to them, send them a lead magnet. And then through the lead magnet, I would have them fill out a questionnaire. And then um, from that questionnaire, I would put them on a segmented list, and then I would run the segmented list, and then at the very end of this, anyone who makes a purchasing decision, I would then go take over here. Like, if you've ever heard anyone tell you all that stuff, or you need to get click funnels, but meanwhile, you know, you need an automated email campaign. You, farmers and marketers will spend so much time trying to crack the code for the perfect combination of things to 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 generate. The, the lowest cost of acquisition, so the lowest cost to get a lead, the highest close rate, the quality of lead, they will do all that because frankly, and, and they might jump on the phone towards the end, but what they're looking for is, is how do I get the highest volume of stuff? And what most farmers mm -hmm. don't talk about is how much time, money, energy, and, and budget is kind of spent learning and testing. And, and so if you are very good at like tracking data and making iterative improvements, you know, quarter after quarter or month after month, and you're always on it and you're always tweaking and you're always split testing and you're always doing those things because you're super data-based or analytical, then you might be a marketer, which means you might be a farmer. But that's very different than the salesperson or the the hunter who's going to go out there and kill stuff. The hunter is like, just just put me on the phone. Just just give me the conversation. Just give me the interest. Just give me the lead. So your brand, if you're if you're a farmer, really needs to support this like omnipresent approach where you are saying the same message, but you're, but it's really actually more about building stuff that's light enough to throw up and light enough to throw away. Mm. You can't make things so complicated and expensive that when you put it up and it doesn't work, 
that, that you have this sunken cost syndrome and you're not willing to move away from it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Probably. now our third category, <laughs> and I know that we're getting deep in this, so I hope this is helpful for people. This is so good. No, I remember when you took me through this before, I was like, that makes total sense. <laughs> the farmer is the, I I know I am not a farmer. I know 100%, but you, you are from my recollection of our conversation. I, I am like a farmer, which works. is, which is why it's like when people are like, Hey, jump on the phone. And I'm like, do I have to? <laughs> do I do we have to or like I never push the clothes and but I should push yeah. the clothes or things like that. So and then the third category my friend Evan Carmichael uh and I've heard this yeah. from so many people who are in certain businesses is Evan is a tribe leader. Mm. And a tribe leader is someone who is amazing at networking, at referral generation, at repeat clients, repeat business, joint ventures, partnerships, like business kind of comes their way. I've I've heard far too many business owners go, you don't need to spend any money on marketing. I, I've been running a business for 30 years and all I do is really just, just do great service, do great work and people will come back to you time and again. And frankly, that's, that's BS. That's not true. <laughs> like, like the reason they say that is because they are inherently amazing at forming connections with people and finding opportunities and being the person that comes back. I've worked with, countless organizations who have zero referrals, who have zero repeat business, even though they do great work. So it's not enough just to do great work. It's to recognize that if you're, if you're, you know, your network is your net worth, that's again, that's true for all of us, but it's especially true for people who are tribe leaders. And so mm. a lot of speakers, a lot of um, personal brands, a lot of people fall into this uh, network marketing, multi-level marketing is 100% percent based on the assumption that people will be amazing tribe leaders and amazing community builders. That is not me. I'm not great at follow-up. I'm not like, I love connecting with people, but if you're not kind of in front of me, I'm like, you're not really in my mind. Like I don't really think of you. And, and so the way that your brand, your marketing, your advertising as a tribe leader needs to support you is very, very, you have to be very careful here because one, this is 100% typically based on personality. So it needs to be authentic. It needs to be real. It needs to be true. Um, it has to be consistent because you are counting on your community and your attachment and, and, and authenticity. And so if there's inconsistencies in where you show up or how you show up or what you say, or what your brand looks like, if it looks mom and pop, if it looks, it's going to erode your credibility instantly. Mm. And the last thing is um, you have to have a path to monetization. Many, many, many tribe leaders ignore whatever the path to monetization is. And so if you're an accountant, and you're running a, a firm uh, or you're a lawyer and you're running a firm, then you have to, you have to find what is my path? Is it, is it through other businesses and partnerships and referrals? Is it, through, um, is it through me just building my book and then constantly getting in front of them every quarter? Like what is the path to monetization? And you have to go all in on that. And so that's the core brand identity. Now, if you think that you are multiple people like, oh man, I'm totally identified with two or three of them. Mm-hmm. Or if you're not quite sure which one you are, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> entrepreneurs, you know, again, we, we all have to sell. We all have to market. We all have to have a bit of a network. But it's not about whether you can do them. It's what is the lowest hanging fruit? What is the thing I should go all in on? Because again, I'm interested in the lowest risk, highest impact, fastest results we can get to build your brand or to generate more leads or to build an audience or to build your network or to recruit better talent or whatever it is. Mm. All of that will touch brand. It'll touch marketing. It'll touch advertising. It'll touch sales. Yeah. Amazing. Oh my gosh. It's amazing. And we can be a blend, right? Cause you and I were talking about that. Like we can be a hybrid ish you, but we always lead with typically one. Is if that you right? are if you're quite mature so so the the real opportunity for us is to identify which one we are right the next step is to be able to build all of our assets and go really like so build our all of our strategies all of our assets everything we need to do to maximize who we are mm-hmm. and once we've maximized our category it's then to look so let's say you know you said you're a tribe leader i believe right mm, i would say primary tribe leader second sales but yeah, okay, so, so let's say that yeah. you're a tribe leader. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so you may have already done this. You may have already um, hit the point of maturity in your business. Now, 
I would argue there's probably strategies you could leverage that will help mm -hmm. you as a tribe leader, again, with low hanging fruit, do more and take it further. But, but let's say that you've really maximized everything. Then what you're going to do is you're going to look at marketing and you're going to look at sales and say, which one, which traits, which elements, which strategies do I believe that I can incorporate and learn? You know, we all know that our personalities are malleable and that we can level up our skills. And we've talked about mindset. So we know we can change, but that change comes at such a cost. It's, it, it distracts us. It slows us down. Now, it's worth it in the long run. But you shouldn't be doing that stuff until you get your core brand identity completely locked down and figured out. And so for you, you may have locked it down and you may then say, okay, so I want to, I want to level up to the next level. And you could look at the farmer or marketing approach. You could look at the, the hunter, the sales approach and say, which one am I most closely attuned to? And, and how can I start to grab their strategies and bring it into me? But mm. it doesn't mean that you're both. You are, you are yeah. one innately Got one it. of them. Oh my gosh. This, there's a couple of things I love about this. And I know, are, are you okay on time? I am. If you are, I know we're like, are you okay? Yeah, I, I am. Let me just, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to drop my, my next meeting, a quick text and let Okay, know. cool. Well, we'll wrap. This is, this is amazing. No, this is fun. I, I knew, this is yeah. I knew when I brought Mark on, I was like, this is going to be hard to cram it in the amount of time that we normally do an interview in. So I'm going to tell you all where you can get more from him shortly because this, this, these concepts are so good, but two, just quick things I want to pull from this. And then I want to, we'll, we'll wrap. Um, one is just this, this concept of alignment, which is one of the core messages of she sells and what we want to encourage people to do and embrace is like, you can find a way to sell and grow your business and your revenue that's in alignment with you. You don't have to try to fit into a box that you were never meant to, or that doesn't feel right. So I think this, this approach is so powerful in that. And then two, it's this concept that I'm playing with in my own life right now too. And it's actually from the science of getting rich. I don't know if you've ever read it, but um, he talks about this, this idea of you have to more than fill your present place. So wherever you are, and, and so it's like, once you're clear on what your core brand identity is, how can you go all out on that? How can you maximize that before you try to go grab and do all these other things? And then from that place of having already maximized where you are, you can grow and expand. So I just, I, this is resonating so much in so many ways with, with me and, and what we want to teach. And, um, what we believe in. So with that, um, two quick questions and we will, we will wrap here, my friend, this has been so good. Thank you. Um, number one, tell everyone where can they connect? Where can they get, um, more of this? I want you to share about your podcast, how they can learn more, how they can connect. Cause it's, it's so, so good. And I know that they're going to want to go deeper. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, so my podcast, how to sell more, you can go to any of the audio apps. You can go to YouTube, look up how to sell more, uh, or my name, Mark Drager. And, and you can check out every week, we put out two episodes, super, super tactical, super strategy based on essentially selling more um, with a bit of a marketing bent, of course, because I come from a branding background and a marketing background. If, if, you, if anything that I've just shared with you, though, has resonated in terms of like, oh, like I'm, I'm, ready, I'm ready to grow my business. I'm ready to, to find a new market. I'm ready to fix the strategies that aren't working. I'm, I'm really ready for change. Now, if you're a B2B business owner and you are ready, and, and I say that because there's a commitment here. There's a commitment of time. There's a commitment of budget. There's a commitment to be able to, to see real results. Then I would, I would welcome you to just reach out to me on Instagram uh, at sales loop brand. Just drop us a DM and we can set up a one-on-one. -on -one. We can do a quick, I will offer that to your audience. Um, now, <laughs> We may have to schedule them far out because I do I do only hold so many slots per month for this. Uh, I typically charge a thousand dollars, but um, but I know you have a pretty kick ass community, so I will I will offer that if you are a B two B business owner and you are ready to be able to take your brand, your marketing, your advertising, and your sales tools to the next level to be able to sell more, especially uh, using your core brand identity. And then I'll, I'll help take you through that just one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. to be able to, to make sure that you are the right one and then explain a little bit more about how it works. Um, and I'll offer that up to your audience. Amazing. Thank you so much. So we'll be sure to link uh, your Instagram there as well. And that's such a cool offer. Thank you. Okay. Final question. I love doing this when I have men on the show. Um, so you're married to your high school sweetheart, Jacqueline, right? 
What is the number one life lesson that you have learned from Jacqueline over the years? I know she's been a great teacher in many ways, no doubt, but what is the number one thing that she has taught you in the time you've known her? Oh my goodness. So, so, I mean, we were 16 when we met and I'm 40 now. So it's been, it's been a very long time. Uh, what I love most about, about my wife and, um, she commits. Mm. So, so I am a starter. I will jump into a million different things. My wife won't start anything unless she understand, unless it's really important because once she commits, no matter what it's going to get done. Mm. And so I have watched, um, I've watched her go through a, cause I'm not big on pattern recognition. I've watched her go through these cycles of like, Oh, this is the worst. And then the next day it's like, Okay, but this is what I have to do. And then the day after that, she's like, oh, I've made some progress. Mm -hmm. And it's this like three day cycle constantly because I'm always, I hate complaining. Like, yeah. like, why are you complaining? And now I know, okay, I'll listen to her complain today because tomorrow she's going to accept it. And then the day after that, she's going to really kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> such a good quality to have in a partner too, especially when you're a starter. Uh, that's yes. Yeah. Now, so we're trying to figure out this whole, like, can I just start things and then hand them to you? But that doesn't work. <laughs> I feel like that sounds too good to be true. I don't know. <laughs> that's good for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Terrible for her. Great for you. <laughs> oh my gosh. This has been incredible. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, man, I, I love this. And so we're going to have you in to speak to my mastermind to go deeper on this too. And I would really encourage everyone listening, go connect with Mark on Instagram, check out his podcast, how to sell more. We'll link it in the show notes, um, to go deeper on your journey, but you are, um, you are brilliant and you bring new ideas that I just, I haven't even thought about before even having been in the space for a long time. And it helps me up level every single time we talk. So thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. Oh. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, team, my listener, you know what to do. Go connect with Mark. Give him a shout out. Let him know that you heard him on She Sells Radio. And as always, thank you so much for being a member of our community. I'll see you on our next episode.